You may be seated. While the, uh, our servants, musicians here are disbanding, uh, I've noticed that some of you this morning are wearing orange clothing of various sorts, uh, a bit of a garrulous choice of uh, clothing color, I must say, but historically appropriate. Um, today is St. Patrick's Day, and uh, seldom falls on a Sunday. Today is one of those days, and orange is the color of the Protestant Reformation's recognition of Patrick. Uh, it's really a celebration of William of Orange, who uh, was governor of a district in Holland called Orange, who uh, brought a political and theological revolution to England in the late 1680s. He became William II, King of Scotland, and then as King of England was called William III, sometimes called King Billy. And uh, so the Protestant Reformation in England really got a, a uh, political and theological uh, kick from William of Orange. And, and as a result, the Protestants sought to reclaim St. Patrick. By the way, St. Patrick was never officially canonized as a saint by the Catholic Church. Um, he is a saint, however, by the New Testament definition, a believer, one set apart for Christ. And uh, you may know that uh, Patrick was um, part of the Roman province of Britannia in the late 400s in what is now Scotland. And he was stolen away by Irish pirates as a 16-year-old and taken into captivity and for a number of years served as a slave in Ireland. Uh, Patrick's parent, Patrick's father was a believer. His grandfather was a pastor. And uh, Patrick had heard the gospel growing up but never surrendered his life to Christ until he was serving as a slave in Ireland, eventually in desperation, uh, surrendered to Christ and believed the gospel that he knew by fact. And he was so moved by the gospel itself that when he was, uh, some say, miraculously freed from slavery and got back home, he felt such a burden for the Irish who had taken him captive that he wanted to go back there and preach the gospel to his captors. And eventually the king of Ireland became a believer. So... Uh, in light of all of that, some of you have worn orange. Uh, that's good. All right. That's not the introduction to the sermon. Why don't we pray, and then we'll dig into Romans chapter 9. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another day to dig into your word. Would you be pleased to replace our own natural human thoughts with your thoughts, would you be pleased to crush human pride and exalt your mercy? Would you please to be pleased this morning to put on display your own glory in your purposes and your plan and your counsel and your character? May all praise go to you. We long for that day when all creatures will bow the knee to the one true God and universal King. In the meantime, God, help us to be faithful uh, to sit up under your word and to think like you think, to be humbled by it, uh, to be content with what you reveal, and to trust you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to turn your attention this morning to Romans chapter 9. We'll be looking again at verses 14 to 18. This is part two of what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And the title of the sermon this morning is, Is God Fair? Is God fair? And this comes from what Paul says as we're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the book of Romans. In Romans 9.14, Paul asks the question, what shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? And his response is, may it never be. I want to ask you this morning a bit of a quiz. You don't have to answer out loud. You can just think of your own answer in your own mind. What is the theme of the Bible? You know, think about that. What is the theme of the Bible? As some of you might be saying, well, uh, the love of God. Or, or you might say God's salvation of sinners. Or you might suggest the rescue of God's people. Perhaps you might say it this way, the glory of God in the rescue of sinners. I would suggest to you this morning that the theme of the Bible is not redemption. Salvation of sinners is not the theme of the Bible. Whatever we state as the theme of the Bible must be able to account for everything in the Bible. Something like an umbrella under which everything in the Bible can stand. 
And the theme of the Bible then cannot be redemption or salvation or rescue, as sweet as these sub-themes are, as precious as they are to us personally. But they can't be the theme of the whole Bible, in short, because not all are saved. Not all are saved. Salvation is not the only story that God is telling. Consider the flood for just a moment. At one point, we were in a Christian school, and our kids were in a Christian school, and my wife happened to be in the classroom and heard the teacher telling a classroom of kids, asking this question, why did God send the flood on the earth? Was it because he was very angry with people? No, and all the kids said, no, teacher. It's because he wanted to give humanity a second chance. Well, that second chance only worked for eight people while the rest of the world was drowned in judgment. And I would suggest that much of our Bible needs to take into consideration the twin themes of God's dealings with humanity. In fact, I believe the verses before us today in Romans 9 are perhaps one of the best summaries of the theme of the Bible. In fact, they summarize all of the world's history. I would suggest the theme of the Bible might be something like this. The glory of God as king, seen in the redemption of sinners and in the judgment of sinners. I think the glory of God as king is the overarching umbrella under which everything in the Bible can fit, which includes not only salvation of those who believe, but also the judgment of those who don't. Let's read together Romans 9, 14 to 18. Here's what God says through the Apostle Paul. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. This set of verses, I believe, demonstrates one of the benefits of consecutive exposition, that is the verse-by-verse explaining of God's Word and what God means by what He says. Because frankly, I would never pick this passage to preach. This is not something my heart is drawn to, that, that my heart just says, oh, I can't wait to preach Romans 9, 14 to 18. And yet, in the study of Romans 9, 14 to 18, we see a glory of God on display that God himself wants to reveal to us his people. And as I said a few moments ago, I believe this glory on display in these verses is actually the umbrella under which all the rest of the Bible stands. And it is God's glory in being God. God's prerogative in his essential character and purpose and plan to save some and to judge others. This is what it means for God to be God, and it's on display here in this passage. We see here God's sovereign selection of sinners. I'm going to turn this microphone off, Tommy, and go to this one. Sound of Lagos. <clears throat> the theme of this passage, oh, I'm really going to have to talk softly, is that God's sovereign selection of sinners to be saved according to his own free purpose is not unjust. And it's not unjust for two reasons, the first of which we looked at two weeks ago. 
That first reason is simply this. God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. God's not unjust in his dealings with sinners because he operates according to his own character and purpose. God himself is not unjust. And so if he operates according to the standard of who he is and what he has designed, then his activities are not unjust either. And the example that we looked at a couple of weeks ago was seen in Moses. Specifically, the issue of the golden calf. The people of God had been rescued from Egypt. And they turned around and partook in idolatry. Moses interceded on, God, on behalf of God's people. And God mercifully pardoned them. And continued to not only let them live, but to be his people to actually be the people among whom God would manifest his very presence. And we see on display God's mercy to graciously rescue a sinner. It is in keeping with his character to do so. Remember that he revealed himself to Moses as Yahweh, the God who is gracious to whom he will be gracious, compassionate to whom he will be compassionate. And Paul quotes from Exodus 33, to demonstrate that God's mercy towards sinners is in keeping with his character. This morning, we're looking at the second reason that God's dealings with sinners is not unjust. It's up on the screen for you now. God operates consistent with his own character and purpose. And yes, it's the same as the first point. (laughs) Different example this time. This time, the example comes from the life of Pharaoh. And, And here, Paul takes us back to the book of Exodus. In fact, the four, here in verse uh, um, 15, is a demonstration of the proof that God is not unjust. And then the four in verse 17 does the same thing. It takes us all the way back to verse 14. It is example number two of the reality that God is not unjust in his dealings with sinners. In his grace to select some to be saved according to his own purpose. And notice verse 17, how Paul introduces this idea. He says, for the scripture says to Pharaoh. For the scripture says to Pharaoh. That's an interesting way to introduce what's going on here. God spoke to Pharaoh. And specifically, God spoke to Pharaoh through his prophet, Moses. But what Paul does here in ascribing this speech to scripture is to put the word of God whether it's in the Bible, whether it's through his prophet, or whether it is direct speech from God himself, are all at the same level. This indicates a high view of the Bible from God's perspective, a high view of inspiration. That is, the the words of God are the very breathed out words, 2 Timothy 3.16. And there's no space between what God says and what the scripture says. Sometimes people want to put space in between these two things. There's no space between God's words to Pharaoh and Moses' communication of those words. Moses faithfully conveyed God's words. And there's no space between Moses' recording of this event in Exodus and the inerrant breathing out of God's very words. And what we have here is a quote of Exodus 9.16. This is what the all capitals indicates in your English text. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. This quote from Exodus 9.16 is interesting, and and pardon me for just a moment for some technicalities. Um, When he says, for this purpose I raised you up, Paul uses an interesting word here, and and in four places, this text differs from what we call the Septuagint. The Septuagint is the New Testament era Greek translation of the Old Testament. It would have been the Bible that most Greek speakers and Greek readers in the New Testament era would have been familiar with. They would have been reading their Bible, their Old Testament, in the Greek language, a translation. And most often, the Apostle Paul is comfortable quoting from that Greek translation and saying, thus says the Lord. That's a, that's a great comforting statement for us in thinking about our English translations. We can say, this is a translation, and we can say, this is the Word of God. Even the New Testament was comfortable doing that. What's interesting is when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament and doesn't use the Septuagint, the Greek translation, but actually reverts back to some features from the original Hebrew text. <laughs> 
And Paul does that four times in this verse. And I think he does so for a very specific reason. Uh, This verb for raised you up is different than the Septuagint verb that's used, a Greek verb that means something like, I've kept you in place. And here Paul departs from that translation, picks a different Greek word to translate Exodus 9.16. And he's getting at something very important. The Hebrew word in Exodus 9.16 means to station or to cause to stand firm. And the opposite of that word would be like to overthrow, to remove somebody from a station or office, to remove somebody from their place. And I think Paul is highlighting something from the original Hebrew that may have been lost in the Greek translation of that verse. So he does his own Greek translation here. For God to cause Pharaoh to stand firm or to station Pharaoh in his role as monarch over the Egyptians at the time of the Exodus involves more than God simply keeping Pharaoh around during the ten plagues. It goes back more to God's intentionality of raising Pharaoh up in the first place and causing him to endure during the ten plagues. The point that Paul is highlighting is this. It was God's intention from beginning to end to bring Pharaoh into existence, to put him into place as ruler over Egypt, and to keep him in place throughout the ten plagues. In other words, Pharaoh didn't die during the ten plagues. Pharaoh wasn't assassinated or in some other way removed from office despite his stubbornness that ruined his country. It was, in fact, God who gave Pharaoh his place of power, and it was God who kept Pharaoh in his place of power so that God could accomplish his purpose. And so Paul says, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So notice the twofold purpose for Pharaoh being raised to power and sustained in power. The first is that God would show his power. And the second was that God's name would be proclaimed through all the earth. So we need to go back to Exodus and pick up the story a little bit. Turn to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus is the second book in your Bible. Exodus simply means exit. It is Israel's escape from slavery out of the clutches of the mighty Egypt. And God has sent Moses to Pharaoh. Moses isn't comfortable speaking in front of Pharaoh. He's not comfortable speaking at all. He's not sure he wants to be the leader that God has established him to be. And yet God says, no, I've made you the leader. I've put my words in your mouth. I'm in charge of things. Go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. This is a remarkably gracious, possessive pronoun that God uses of Israel. My people. He's promised to be their God. He's promised them to be his people. And he's going to extract them from Egyptian slavery. He sends Moses to send the message to Pharaoh. But notice verse 21 of Exodus 4. Yahweh said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. There's a remarkable interchange in this story of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Ten times it is said that Yahweh hardens Pharaoh's heart. And a number of times it is said that Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Thank you, Josh. Awesome. But what's interesting about this narrative is it begins in chapter 4, verse 21. The first declaration of Pharaoh's heart being hardened is God's own initiative. God promises, I will harden his heart. And it comes with a purpose clause. So that, do you see it there in verse 21? So that he will not let the people go. Why couldn't this story have just worked out that God tells Moses, go tell Moses to say to Pharaoh, let the people go. And Pharaoh says, all right. And they just walk out. Why was that not God's plan? We'll see as this unfolds. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh. And besides, I will not let Israel go. What is in Pharaoh's heart at this point? Rank, unbelief, and obstinacy. He's not going to let Israel go. 
He's committed to building his own empire for his own vainglory at the behest of slave labor. He doesn't want to let all of that go. Look at chapter 6, verse 7. God says, then I will take you for my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God. If we were to take the time to read all of these chapters dealing with the plagues falling on Egypt, we'd just see over and over again the word know. That Pharaoh would know things, that Israel would know things, and that the nations of the earth would know things. Look at chapter 7, verse 3. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Verse 5. The Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. Verse 13. Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Verse 14. Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. Verse 22, the magicians of Egypt did the same with their secret arts, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. In verse 15 of chapter 8, Pharaoh saw that there was relief from the plague. He hardened his heart and did not listen to them as Yahweh had said. Verse 19 of chapter 8, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. In other words, they couldn't replicate this plague. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them, as Yahweh had said. In verse 32 of chapter 8, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Chapter 9, verse 7, the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Verse 12 of chapter 9, Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart. Verse 16, for this reason I have allowed you to remain in order to show you my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself. And this here, Exodus 9.16, is what Paul picks up in Romans 9.17 to make a demonstration of God's purposes in his selective mercy. And think about the twofold purpose of God that God himself lays out in Exodus 9.16 and repeats in Romans 9.17. Do you see it? First he says, I will show you my power. Who's the you? Who's the you? It's Pharaoh. God wants to show Pharaoh who said, I don't know who Yahweh is. And even if I did know, I wouldn't obey him. God's going to show Pharaoh something different. God's going to humble him. God's going to crush him. God is, in fact, going to show Pharaoh who is the sovereign, who is in charge. Who is truly in charge here? Is it the sovereign tyrant of the world superpower or the God of Israel, the true King of kings and Lord of lords? And the second part of the twofold purpose of God here is to proclaim my name through all the earth. See, it's more than Pharaoh that needs to know the truth of God's character and his purpose. The whole earth must know. The whole earth must know who this God is. And both of these examples, both uh, the example of the people with the golden calf who receive mercy and the example of Pharaoh who is hardened, both of these highlight the human dilemma, the tendency of the human heart to run contrary to God and contrary to his ways. This is how we all are naturally, the golden calf incident and an oppressive tyrant. God worked for mercy to some and judgment of others. And not because Pharaoh was naturally worse than the golden calf worshipers. And not because the Israelites were better than the Egyptians. But solely because God has mercy on whom he will and he hardens whom he will. Both of these examples, by the way, highlight God's commitment to his own name. That is his character. Back in Romans 9, 15, the example was to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And that quotation comes from Exodus 33, you remember, where Moses demands or asks, pleads with God to see his glory. God says, I'll show you my name. And then from the declaration of his name comes this declaration that God is merciful to whom he will be merciful and compassionate to whom he will be compassionate. That is, it is bound up in the very nature and character and purpose of God to be kind to people who don't deserve it, to be gracious to people who have offended him, to be merciful to sinners. 
And then we get this other statement in verse 17 that is also built on God's name. God is kind to display himself, to put himself on display, to reveal himself to us. And and in verse 17, he says that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. God's glory bound up in his character and his purposes is related to his name. The God of Israel, Yahweh, the one true God, the maker of the universe and redeemer of his people, is also the God who judges sin. And then Paul brings all of this to the logical inference in verse 18. So then, Paul concludes, God has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. This is the godness of God in these verses. It is his prerogative to have mercy on some who sin and to judge others who sin. And to harden a heart, from God's perspective, is not to create evil where no evil existed. The Bible is clear that God is not the author of sin. He does not create evil. It is not to materially change what is inside the heart of Pharaoh, but it is, in fact, to judicially solidify what is there, to solidify it in its condition. And and the hardening of a heart is punitive. It is, in fact, punishment. It is divine retribution for sin. There are a number of ways that God punishes sin. Uh, Of course, in the lake of fire and eternal judgment is the final and ultimate eternal unflinching wrath of God against sin. That is the totality of his punishment. Or his wrath can only be exhausted against sin by an infinite duration. And it's not the only way he judges sin. Uh, There is, of course, just the consequent uh, results of sinful actions built into the way God has ordained things. And there is what theologians call the judicial hardening of God. That is, God hardens people in their state of unbelief, in their state of rebellion against Him. As one commentator on this passage said, God hardened Pharaoh's heart as he declared from the beginning of the history that he would do. But he did not put evil in there. There was no need for this, for Pharaoh was previously wicked, like all mankind. And what's interesting in the case of Egypt is that the judgment against Egypt is simultaneously the rescue of Israel. God's singular activity of getting Israel out of Egypt is the rescue of God's people and the punishment of his people's captors. Perhaps you've heard it said, the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. Another way to say that is the same sodium hydroxide that cleans the steel dissolves the aluminum. When I was in uh, aircraft mechanic school, uh, learning what a wrench was for the first time, we had free access to the the lab and uh, the the mechanic shop, and we were allowed to go in and work on our cars. Uh, There was... There were some things that were off limits. Uh, you weren't allowed to get into the engine degreaser. It was a, a vat of sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is wonderful stuff and dangerous stuff. Uh, it's designed to get gunk off of steel, and it's very effective as long as you don't leave the steel in there too long. Uh, so uh, one of our uh, classmates decided he would uh, dismantle his entire car engine and degrease it, and over the weekend, secretly put all the parts into the vat. And he came on Monday morning, and he thought that somebody had pulled a prank on him, or maybe one of the professors had caught him in the act and removed his engine parts. Uh, The only thing left in the vat were a couple of stainless steel bolts. Everything else was gone. Well, he'd taken his old Volkswagen engine and put it in the vat. It was made of aluminum. And it was completely dissolved. So the same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay, or the same sodium hydroxide that cleans the steel dissolves the aluminum. And the same activity of God to rescue his people in love and kindness and mercy 
was simultaneously the dismantling of a world empire, the humiliation of its tyrant leader, and the destruction of Egypt. Consider your own life for a moment, friends. Think about what happens when trials come into your life. You may experience the exact same kind of circumstance that an unbeliever experiences. And yet it is intended by God to have a different result in you than in our unbelieving friends. Trials designed by God in our lives to produce perseverance and character and hope that does not disappoint. Things designed by God to drive us closer to Him, to make us less dependent on, our, on ourselves, to loosen our white-knuckle grip on idolatries, to promote in us a greater anticipation of heaven, to make us love sin less, to produce a joy in us that transcends our circumstances. This is God's design for trials in you, believer. And yet the same circumstances can produce in a hard heart Bitterness, ingratitude, rancor against God, and unbelief. Think about the last hard day you experienced, the, the last bit of injustice that you suffered at the hands of someone else, the, the last bit of unfair treatment you received, or physical difficulty. How did you respond? And what does that reveal about the condition of your own heart? You see, the, the same sun can melt wax and harden clay. And God's mercy to Israel meant the destruction of Egypt. The salvation of his people was the annihilation of Pharaoh and his army. And God's name and his glory was to be exalted throughout the world in the saving of his people and in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. I want you to listen to the psalmist reflecting on this historical event, Psalm 136, 10 to 15. To him, that is to God, who smote the Egyptians in their firstborn, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Smote the firstborn Egyptians, loving kindness. How do these things work out? God is judging sinners and rescuing his people. Verse 11, and he brought Israel out from their midst, for his loving kindness is everlasting. With a strong hand and an outstretched arm, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, for his loving kindness is everlasting. And he made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his loving kindness is everlasting. For he overthrew Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Do you see what God is putting on display here? And listen to the result of God's work as his fame spread throughout the nations, which God said was his very purpose in raising Pharaoh up and sustaining him in his tyrannical, rebellious, unbelieving reign. Joshua 2, 9 and 10. I know that Yahweh has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. These are the nations of the earth responding to the fame of Yahweh. And that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you, Israel. For we have heard how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. You see, God's fame had gone out even ahead of the Israelites. Their job as a nation was to proclaim the glories of Yahweh. And yet, before they could even get there, <coughs> the nations know who Yahweh is and what he does. Joshua 9.9, 9, they said to him, your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of Yahweh your God, for we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt. Psalm 78 says, he wrought wonders before their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters stand up like a heap. And later you can read Psalm 105. Israel needed to remember what God had done for them. Israel needed to feel the freshness of their rescue from slavery, just like you and I need to be reminded 
of the recent rescue that we benefited from God and our salvation from sin and its consequences. We need regularly to be reminded of, of who we were apart from Christ and what God has done for us in Christ. That God would take our sins and transfer them to the account of His Son and then punish His Son for our sins on the cross so as to fully extinguish His wrath against us. Not only to pardon our sins, but to purchase for us and give to us as a free gift His perfect righteousness, whereby we could stand in the presence of His blazing glory and not be incinerated by it, but actually enjoy it. To delight in Him. What amazing grace God has given us, and at what infinite cost. Do you remember it? Do you reflect on it, believer, moment by moment, day by day, week by week, and year by year? Israel needed to remember their rescue. And the world needed to see what God had done for Israel for two reasons. That the nations might stream to Israel and know the one true God. And that they would glorify him for his power. That God's own fame and might and hatred of sin would be on display before a watching world. The world needed to see what God had done for Israel and they needed to see what God had done to Egypt. And all of this redounds to the fact that God is God. One commentator said that God proceeds in conformity to his justice. He is infinitely just in hating, hardening, and condemning sinners, in adjudging them to punishment for their wickedness, and in placing them in situations in which, in the free exercise of their own evil dispositions, they will do what the Lord has appointed for his own glory. And so God pardons and he hardens. All of it for the renown of his own name, his own purposes, his own fundamental godness. For God to grant mercy to the undeserving is actually in keeping with his character. That's why there's no injustice with God if he forgives a sinner. It's just like God to forgive a sinner. And for God to punish sinners is also in keeping with his character. There's no injustice with God if God punishes sin. It's just like God to do that. You know, there is no violation of justice anywhere in it. Nobody gets injustice from God. Do you understand? Some get mercy, but nobody gets injustice. To confer favors freely, one author says, consistent with divine wisdom, does injury to no one. Is it fair for God to let people act according to their own nature and even to solidify them in that behavior? Yes. In fact, Pharaoh did exactly what Pharaoh wanted. Pharaoh never felt like a robot. Pharaoh did precisely what God intended. Think about Matthew 13. Matthew 13 is sort of the, the hinge chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the life and story of Jesus. And in Matthew 12, the religious leaders of Israel have come to Jesus and they said, you're casting out demons by the power of Satan. And Jesus says, hey, you can say anything you want about me, this is a paraphrase, but you can't talk about the Holy Spirit like that. And he calls it the unpardonable sin. Not repeatable to today, but able to be done then when the Holy Spirit could be blasphemed for the work of the Son of Man while on the earth, in the flesh, with the finger of God casting out demons right before their eyes. Why did they reject Jesus' words? Why did they uh, blaspheme the work of the Holy Spirit through him? Because they were hard-hearted in unbelief. What is Jesus' response in Matthew 13? He stops speaking publicly clearly. Every public instruction from Matthew 13 on is done in parables. And his disciples are confused. They come to him and they say, uh, Lord, why are you talking this way? And nobody understands what you're saying, but, but you explain it to us in private. And Jesus turns to them and says, to you it has been granted, graced, given to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them not. 
That is a judicial act of God to withhold light and truth from those who refuse to see it when it was in front of them. I think about Romans chapter 1. God gave them over three times in Romans chapter 1. God gave them over to further sin. God gave them over to further futility in their thoughts. God gave them over to fuller expressions of their own depravity. This again is judicial hardening, a solidifying of a heart bent on rebellion and unbelief. Just like the Pharisees in in Matthew 12, they were already in a condition of unbelief, and Jesus hardened them in it. In Romans chapter 1, the the, those who have rebelled against God and worshipped everything other than God are in rebellious unbelief against God and God gives them over more fully to it. Pharaoh, before Exodus 4.21, was in a state of rebellious unbelief against the one true God. As a cruel tyrant building an empire as a glorious monument to his own pride and vanity, on the backs of a mass of humanity conscripted as slaves, unwilling to pay them, unwilling to let them go. He was already in rebellion against God, and God hardened his heart. By the way, the doctrine of hell, the biblical doctrine of eternal conscious torment under the unflinching wrath of Almighty God forever and ever and ever, is a hardening in unbelief. Do you recognize that when believers go out of this life, when they step out of time into eternity and they meet God face to face, they will be forever solidified in that state of unbelief and face the consequences for it. There's no purgatory. There's no second chance. There's no annihilation. I think about fallen angels. No opportunity for mercy or grace or repentance or forgiveness for fallen angels. They disobeyed God. Game over. Hardened, forever solidified in unbelief. I guess they believe. They're orthodox in their doctrine. They're rebellious. Proverbs 16.4 says this, The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Let's look back at our passage in Romans 9 again and and, and read it from verses 14 to 18. What shall we say then? Is there injustice with God? Is God allowed to love Jacob and hate Esau? Paul says, may it never be that there would be injustice in God. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. And to the natural man, these answers to these perplexing questions are unsatisfying. But if we have taught our hearts to think as God thinks, to trust in God, we can be satisfied with God's answers, for they terminate in Him. Think about your own heart in this. Are you satisfied by God's answer? Or do you say, God's not really answering the question here. I need an appeal to a higher authority than God himself. I I need something other, other than his own secret purposes and counsel. I need something bigger and larger than his character. I think God needs to be accountable to another standard. Whose standard is that? Is, Is it yours, friend? Would God be subject to fallen notions of fairness? Would God be in the dock? Would would he be the defendant in a trial where he is accused of violating some standard external to himself? Something bigger than him, better than him. What is it in us that wants to demand an explanation from God that goes beyond the purpose and character of God? To put God on trial. 
rather than seeing the problem is with us. That temptation, that tendency in us is is revealing of our own residual depravity. That there are things in us which still are pulled by who we used to be, by who we were by nature. Do we really believe that God is not right in his dealings? Are we really willing to deal with God on terms of righteousness? I don't think a sinner wants to do that. God, you must do what is right. Again, if God does what is right, then then there's no mercy. If God only treats us according to what we deserve, then there's no hope. Shouldn't we actually rejoice in whatever it is God chooses to do? I'll paraphrase Martin Luther here for a moment. Since God cannot do evil, why shouldn't our greatest concern be that his will gets done? Do you understand? I can do evil. I do evil. Why would I demand that my will get done? When when God is unflinchingly committed to that which is right and pure and holy all the time, and he cannot lie, and he cannot do evil, shouldn't we want his will to get done all the time? And someone might reply, well, God's will is not good. Well, that's not true. If you say, well, God's will is not good for me, if my heart's hardened and I'm being punished... God's will is only bad for bad men who don't want God's good will. We've made evil good and good evil. We've exchanged our definitions for God's. If they willed what God wills, they would not consider God's will evil, says Luther. The solution with all of this is God. Do you and I have a right to mercy? Are we entitled to grace? And the answer, of course, is no. Should we demand mercy? Are we deserving of mercy? Some people think this way. You know, so-and-so is a pretty good guy. He's not as bad as the rest. Therefore, he deserves that God would be merciful to him. We dare say no such thing. What any man deserves is infinite wrath. You see, it is self-righteousness that is offended at mercy given to manifest sinners. William Tyndale, in his introduction to his translation of the English Bible, in the, tra- in the introduction to the book of Romans, he wrote this, Unless you have borne the cross of adversity and temptation, and unless you have felt yourself brought unto the very brim of desperation, yes, even unto hell's gates, You can never meddle with the sentence of predestination without your own harm, without secret wrath and grudging inwardly against God. For otherwise, it shall not be possible for you to think that God is righteous and just. That's exactly the question at stake here. Is God righteous? Is he just in his dealings with men? And Tyndale says, if you've never come to the end of yourself, if you've never come to the realization of the depths of your own sin, and even seeing your soul hanging in the balance between heaven and hell, if you've never been there, will you grumble against predestination? Yeah. But when you've come to grips with the depths of your own sin and your own desperate need of a Savior, and you see that your only hope is God's initiating love and grace and mercy and kindness to the one who could not deserve it, who could never merit it, when you realize that God didn't help you because you were somehow lovelier than your neighbor, better than, your other, better than other people you know, but only because of his grace. When you get there, the, the problems of predestination fall away. Should I demand of God fairness according to my own standard? What's in my heart? <laughs> Or should I be eager to let God be God and to make his choices according to his own counsel and wisdom and purpose and goodness? What should I do this morning if I sense hardness in my own heart? If I feel hard thoughts against God, if I feel the temptation towards disbelief, unbelief, rebellion, 
If my heart has become calloused, if I love sin more than the glory of God, if I love me more than the glory of God, what, what do I do? I would say the answer is simple and it is supernatural. It's impossible, naturally speaking. The answer is simply soften your heart. Confess hard-heartedness to God. Listen, it's okay to go to God and say, God, I don't like you right now. <laughs> I don't like what I think you're doing. I, I disagree with your word. Confess that. It's better than hiding it. It's better than staying in it. And turn from it. Ask God to give you a softness of heart that yields to his word, that melts under the sunshine of his love. God loves to answer that prayer. And the means of grace by which God softens a heart are, again, simple. God's word, prayer. Go to him. Hear from him and pour out your heart before him. Confess it for what it is and ask him to change you. What should you do this morning if you sense a hardness in a heart of someone you love? Well, as long as they're on the earth, breathing God's air, walking his green grass, there is hope. Just like Moses prayed in Exodus 32 on behalf of the people, pray and pray some more and watch God answer prayer. As long as it takes, as long as there is still breath, pray, there is still hope. Why did God soften Nebuchadnezzar's heart and not Ahab's? These things are in his secret counsel. But Nebuchadnezzar was a tyrannical ruler opposed to God and his ways from a foreign land, a pagan idolater. And, and God broke him, made him a worshiper. Think about Manasseh. And you can read later 2 Chronicles 33. In verse 9, it says that Manasseh led Israel to more sin than they had done ever before him. He's a bad guy. And verses 12 and 13, God humbled him and made Manasseh know that Yahweh is the one true God of Israel and caused Manasseh to follow him. Think about a thief on a cross, a hardened criminal. Even despising God as he hung on the cross of his own execution, mocking Christ from one cross to another. And yet at some point, supernatural intervention, the mercy of God, the lights come on, and that thief hanging on a cross about to die calls out to the Savior. And, and Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. You're alive here today and you're breathing Friends, you must know there is hope <coughs> that I could speak, that a hard heart could be changed. Reach out to the only one who can save you from your sin, the one true God of all the universe, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, given as a ransom for many, to redeem all who will call out to him in faith. Again, we find God's kindness articulated in 2 Timothy 1.9. God saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Let's pray. <coughs> God, we could only bank on your grace We could only look to you to be merciful to the undeserving if we would have any hope of rescue. I pray that we would feel all over again this morning, all of us who know you, the near escape from eternal destruction that you brought about by your grace. Were it not for grace, we know what we would be, wandering down some hopeless road to nowhere with our salvation left to us. We know how that would go. And you stepped in and gave life 
while we were running away from you. God, would you be merciful even this morning to impart spiritual life to those who are not yet alive. May their eyes be opened and their ears be opened. May their heart be soft before you. Oh God, would you raise the dead in our midst even here today? We ask it for your glory that the nations might know that you are God and that we might rejoice in your goodness towards sinners. It's in Jesus' name we pray.